Okay, uh, a few a few class related things before I get into the lecture material. Um, I sent an email about this yesterday, but some of you are too cool to read my emails, so in case you didn't, um, I want to let you know that a week from today the exam starts, in case you've forgotten. Um, hopefully you didn't forget. So that's starting up. Make sure you sign up if you haven't. Um, unfortunately, I have some limitations this week in terms of my availability that are out of my control, which is really bad timing, but I couldn't do anything about it. So um, on Thursday and Friday of this week, uh, I won't have any office hours. And because of this, I also will be unavailable for an exam review, which I customarily do before the exams, usually the Friday before they start. So what I encourage you to do is I posted the, um, the review packet on, on Blackboard, and I also have a link to the YouTube video. It's going to be identical material, so it really wouldn't be much different anyway, although there's some benefits to doing it live, I understand. So I will have exam reviews for um, subsequent exams, probably on the Friday before, but this one I won't be available for that. However, the week of the exam, um, which happens Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I should be around all the time, so you're welcome to to come see me if you have questions as you're doing your last minute preparation. Um, there are no other announcements today as far as I know. Um, the, la the other thing I want to remind you of, because it's I think this is about where it is in the textbook, if you're following the textbook, um, we have this one topic uh, that's um, lattice energy or Born-Haber cycles. And I want to remind you, it's on the syllabus, but that also seems to be something that many of you are, are uh, too busy to read. Um, so the last energy in born hybrid cycles is not going to be covered until Chapter 7. So you might see this in the textbook. Um, hopefully they don't do it in workshops or anything, because it's not going to be covered until Chapter 7. It's a topic that requires a large leap of faith from where we are now, so we thought it was better to cover it then at a more appropriate time. So that's going to be skipped. That's in Chapter 3 in your book, which we're about in the middle of right now, but we're not going to do that yet. So if you think I've forgotten to cover that, it's not the case. We'll just see it later. All right, so with that, let's get into what we're doing, which is stuff towards the end of Chapter 3. So Chapter 3 is the last chapter on the first exam. Um, normally, we would have been just about finished, but because of the, the cancellation we had, but we'll still finish it uh, mostly by the end of today. We'll just touch on a couple of last things on, on Wednesday, and then we'll be all, all cut up for the exam material. So anyway, we're going into what are called Lewis structures now. So last time, if you recall, we talked about a lot of properties of um, bonds, both ionic and covalent bonds. We finished with a, a few properties of covalent bonds, namely their bond energy, which is the amount of energy it takes to break the bond, the radius, um, and some trends that are, that are involved with that. And so today we're going to talk about Lewis structures, which tells us also, in addition to the bonds that exist between atoms in a molecule, what, where do all the other electrons go, the ones that aren't involved in the bonds. Each bond is only two electrons. There are, in most cases, many other valence electrons that you have to consider as well. And then also, if we have a, uh, something that's simpler than a diatomic, so more than two atoms bonded to each other, how do they arrange themselves and, and how many bonds are formed and all that stuff. So that's what we're going to deal with today when we talk about Lewis structures. Um, so Lewis structures are two-dimensional representations of molecules. They don't say anything about the three-dimensional shape. We'll get to that in Chapter 4 for the next exam. Um, but Lewis structures are two-dimensional representations. And the key point is that they show all of the valence electrons. And this is why you know, we talked about valence electrons a little bit ago and, and how to determine which electrons in an atom are valence. And one of the reasons they're important is because these are the electrons that are involved when you're forming molecules. And so the Lewis structure will show the location or the uh, arrangement of all of those valence electrons. And we've already seen depictions of two atoms bonded to each other with lines in between them. So it's really the same thing, where each of the atoms that's in the molecule is represented by its atomic symbol. So it shouldn't be any surprises there. And then a detail that comes into play now, which we didn't really talk about when we were just talking about bonds, um, we know that there's going to be some number of electrons that are shared in the bond. We said it could be either two electrons for a single bond, four electrons for a double, or six up to six electrons for a triple bond. But then there are also 
valence electrons that are not involved in bonds. So the bonding pairs are the ones that we kind of talk, already talked about. They're shared between the two atoms, and they're going to be shown as, um, as solid lines, typically. We said there's also a dot notation that you can use where you show pairs of dots in between atoms to indicate that it's a bond, but more, more conventionally you're going to see them shown as solid lines indicating that that is a, a shared pair of electrons. And then we also have um, lone pairs. These are what are the non-bonding pairs of electrons. So the rest of the valence electrons that aren't involved in forming bonds are going to be um, not a particularly descriptive name, non-bonding pairs, but often called lone pairs. Um, these ones we're going to almost always show as dots. There's also a line notation for this, but the one that we'll use in homework assignments is just dots. We'll, we'll almost always have them as pairs together. Um, and the key thing about these, we haven't seen them yet, is that they're not involved in bonding. So they are valence electrons, but they're not involved in forming bonds. And they're going to be localized on one of the atoms in the structure. They're not going to be shared between two. They're going to be completely localized. Okay, so that's the deal with lone pairs. We haven't seen those yet. And so our Lewis structure is going to show both the bonding pairs and the lone pairs. It's going to show everything. So what we're going to do now is kind of go through a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to draw Lewis structures, a very one that's going to be generally applicable. And as we go through, we'll work through three examples that show you some different features of Lewis structures that you'll come across. Um, I have it broken down, I think, into three or in about four steps, but you can break it down in different numbers of steps depending on how you think about this. And this is another one of those things where you're going to want to practice it a lot because it's going to not only be important for this chapter, but for a lot of other things we'll do later on, especially chapter four and even stuff beyond that. So drawing Lewis structures is important. You want to get to be able to do it very quickly and efficiently. So the first step and the one that you absolutely have to do, there's no, there's no way around this one, is you, you need to find the total number of valence electrons. We need to know how many electrons are we going to even put into this structure to begin with. And so for that, we use the periodic table to help us, and we add up the total for each atom. So we're going to know the chemical formula of whatever Lewis structure we're trying to draw, and so we're going to know how many valence electrons each atom contributes, and we're going to add those all up. Okay. Now one thing that's important that sometimes people forget is you need to account for how many of each atom there is in the formula. Okay, so some chemical formulas have the same atom appearing more than once. So, if, for example, if we had carbon dioxide CO2, you'd have to make sure when you're counting valence electrons, you account for the fact that there are two oxygens, each of them providing a certain number of valence electrons, which would be six, as we'll see. All right, and then in terms of the elements and how many valence electrons they have, um, the one that is very easy and you shouldn't have to think about it, if you look at the periodic table, is hydrogen. This has one valence electron, a hydrogen atom. It only has one electron total, so that's, of course, the valence. And what we should do with hydrogen when we're drawing Lewis structures is this is the one that's sort of the no-brainer. It contributes one valence electron, and it's always going to form just a single bond, nothing else. Okay, so a hydrogen atom will never have double or triple bonds. A hydrogen atom will never have any lone pairs or non-bonding electrons around it. It will always just have one single bond and you're done. If you try to do anything else, if you try to add double bonds or lone pairs to hydrogen, every time that happens, a, a small piece of me dies, so don't do that. Um, this is the one that you didn't have, shouldn't have to think about. Now for the rest of them, for the S and P block elements, we're primarily going to be doing Lewis structures for non-metal, you know, molecular compounds with things from the P block on the right side of the periodic table, but you, the, the same thing applies for the S block as well. We need to know how to count the valence electrons, and that's going to go into then determining how many bonds it forms, as we'll see. And so if, if we're going to count the valence electrons, we have to count the outer shell S and P electrons, whatever the highest value of N is. If it's an S block element, it only has S electrons to count, but if it's a P block element, we have to count both of those as valence electrons as we talked about. 
you can sort of shortcut your way to that by looking at the group number. Remember that these apply to just the highest value of n. They're not all the S and P electrons, just the ones in the outer shell. But you can shortcut your way to that with the group number. So our periodic table is numbered um, in sort of the old school way, which is um, in some cases not as simple, but also is more helpful. So if you look at our periodic table, each of the columns has a number above it, and some of them are labeled as A, some of them are labeled as B. So the transition metals are labeled as B, and the numbering down here is sort of a historical relic that doesn't make a lot of sense. But the numbering of the main group elements, the first two columns and the ones in the P block, which are all labeled as A's, tells you exactly how many valence electrons there are. All right, so if we're in group 1A, that means there's one valence electron. If we're in 2A, that means there's two. 3A has three, 4A has four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons. So counting valence electrons for the main group elements, especially with our version of periodic table, is very simple. You just need to look at the group number as long as you can read Roman numerals, okay? All right, so that's how we do it. And then the other thing we have to account for when we're totaling up the number of valence electrons are the charges. So we are also going to draw Lewis structures for species that have net charges. We call those polyatomic ions. We'll see them in another context later today. And so we have to account for if, the fa if there is a net charge in whatever it is we're drawing the Lewis structure of. So if we have a negative charge, we have to add electrons, additional electrons beyond what we get from each atom. And then if we have a positive charge in our polyatomic ion, we have to subtract electrons from whatever total we get by just summing up each atom. Okay, so there's sort of two steps involved. If you have a charged species, you have to count the valence electrons from the atoms first, and then you have to account for the net charge by either adding or subtracting electrons from that. So we'll see an example of that here. So that's step one, and there's, like I said, there's not really a shortcut to that. So the three examples we're going to work through is going to, are going to be PCL3, NO3 minus, and IF5. These all de demonstrate some different things about, about Lewis structures. Let's count up the valence electrons in these. So let's start with sort of a full um, treatment of this. We'll go a little bit faster as we get used to this. So phosphorus, we need the electron configuration. We need to figure out how many valence electrons it has. So if we go to phosphorus on the periodic table, it's atomic number 15. So the noble gas before that is neon, so that's going to be our core. And then our valence electrons are going to be 3s2, this is the third row, and then 3p123 takes us here to phosphorus. Okay. So our, our, elect our full electron configuration for phosphorus is neon, 3s2, 3p3. Remember, the only ones that are valence electrons are the S and P electrons in the outer shell, so it's S2, P3, for a total of five valence electrons. That we should already know how to do from what we talked about in Chapter 2. So phosphorus has five, and then chlorine, Cl, is just two to the right of phosphorus, so it's going to be neon, 3S2, and then we put two more electrons in to make it 3P5. It's in the, the second to last column, or the P5 column. And this is going to then be a total of seven valence electrons, two from the S, five from the P, two plus five is seven. And then we need to add them up for all of the atoms, and so this is where you have to also account for how many of them there are. So there's one phosphorus that contributes five electrons. We have three chlorines, Cl3 is the formula. Those each contribute seven. So one times five plus three times seven is 26 valence electrons. So this molecule, this loose structure that we're going to draw for PCL3 should have a total of 26 electrons in it when we're done. So that's why we count them up at the beginning. NO3 minus is going to be the next one we'll do. So we have nitrogen and oxygen in this one. If we go to the periodic table, we see that nitrogen is here in group 5A, so that means it has five valence electrons. Oxygen is right next to it, 6A, so each oxygen has six valence electrons. So that's the number of valence electrons for nitrogen and oxygen. So we have one nitrogen with five. We have three oxygens, each with six. So that's another 18 electrons. But then we also have to account for the negative charge. This is NO3 minus with a minus one charge, so we have to add one additional electron to that total. Jumping on me, sorry. 
And so when we add these up, the total comes to 24 electrons. Okay, so 24 valence electrons for nitrate, NO3 minus. And then IF5, iodine and fluorine are both halogens, so they both have seven valence electrons. We have seven from iodine, we have five fluorines that each also contribute seven valence. And so this one would have a total of 42 electrons. Okay, so different numbers of electrons for each of these, and we want to be able to do this at the beginning so that we know when we start drawing the Lewis structure, how many electrons should we add in and when should we stop, basically. Okay, so any questions on how we get those numbers? All right, so valence electrons will come up on their own in the context of Chapter 2, and now we're going to have to use that here to be able to count the number of valence electrons that each of these structures has. Now, Step 2 in drawing a Lewis structure is uh, pretty simple. You're going to just place the least electronegative atom in the center and draw a single bond to the other atoms. Now, usually it's fairly obvious which one goes in the center because we have one phosphorus and three chlorines. So we put the one that's a single one by itself, phosphorus, in the center. NO3 minus, we put the nitrogen in the center surrounded by three oxygens. IF5, there's one iodine, five fluorines, so we put iodine in the middle. That almost always is going to be the least electronegative atom that goes in the center. We talked about electronegativity last time as well. Uh, if there's any doubt, well, if it's, it's kind of it's kind of an unclear one, we'll tell you which atom is the central atom in some cases, so you don't have to think about it. But if we just give you the formula, it's pretty obvious from the formula, or we look at electronegativity to decide. So for PCl3, we're going to put phosphorus in the middle, and then the, well, all we're going to do to start with is we're going to draw a single bond between the central atom and all of the atoms on, that are bonded to it. So PCl3 is going to have single bonds to each of the chlorines. Actually, I'm going to draw this in another orientation so I don't change it later and confuse anybody. It doesn't really matter how you draw these, though. These are just random two-dimensional representations. It doesn't matter what shape you give them. Okay, so we're going to put phosphorus with three single bonds to chlorine. And then we want to take into account how many of those electrons we've used. So, as we said, there's 26 total valence electrons. By drawing three single bonds, remember each single bond is two electrons. So there's two, four, six electrons that are used up in the bonds. So we still have 20 electrons left that we have to figure out what to do with. That's going to come in the next steps. Okay, but we draw single bonds to start with, and that's going to use up some of that electron, that, that valence electron total. NO3 minus is really the same thing. Nitrogen in the center, single bonds to all of the oxygens. In this case, we're going to have a total of 24 electrons, and then we have three single bonds. So that's going to take out six of those. So we still have 18 left to deal with. And then finally, IF5. Uh, this one is going to be iodine at the middle, and then five single bonds to fluorine. However, we choose to arrange those is up to you. Okay, but five single bonds like that, all to the outer atoms, and then keeping track of how many electrons we've used, we started with 42 electrons. We counted that up in the previous step. We're using 10 electrons in this case. We've made five single bonds, so each one is two electrons. So two, four, six, eight, ten. That leaves us with 32 electrons. All right, so the very first thing you want to do once you know how many valence electrons there are is put the central atom in the middle and just draw single bonds to all the ones on the outside. But then, as you see, in most cases, we're going to have a lot of leftover electrons to deal with, 20 more, 18 more, 32 more. Uh, so we have to figure out where those go uh, in the subsequent steps. So step three is going to be to arrange the rest of those and we're going to distribute those as lone pairs. So whatever we don't use to make single bonds, we're going to first put them down as lone pairs. We'll deal with the possibility of drawing double bonds and triple bonds a little bit later. But we're, what we're going to first do with all of those extra electrons is we're going to distribute them as lone pairs. Now where do they go? Do they go on the central atom? Do they go on the outer atoms? Do they go on some combination? The first thing you want to do is complete what's called the octet of all the outer atoms. So we start with the outer atoms and we're, we're going to give them lone pairs first. Now what do we mean by octet? We need to define that for a second. So we haven't seen that word yet. So as the name implies, octet refers to eight. And what it tells us is this octet rule, as we call it, 
is that in general you're going to have the number of bonding plus non-bonding electrons This, of course, doesn't include hydrogen, which only has one single bond. But for things in the P block of the periodic table, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all the halogens, all those things in the right side of the periodic table in the P block, typically you're going to have a combination of bonding and non-bonding electrons that equals 8. We'll talk about the exceptions to this, but one thing to keep in mind is that the outer atoms in a Lewis structure, the ones that are on the outside, they're never going to have anything other than 8 unless it's hydrogen. Okay, so if you have one of these p-block elements and it's one of your outer atoms, it's always going to have exactly eight electrons. So we start by completing that octet by adding lone pairs. Um, and then, if we have any leftover electrons after that, we're going to add those to the central atom. All right, so we never add more than eight total to the, the outer atoms, but if you have any leftover, you can add those to the central atom. And sometimes, as we'll see, the central atom can go beyond eight electrons. Okay, so that's sort of where the second place that you're going to go to to add lone pairs. Now, I want to be uh, familiar with a few patterns that emerge when we do this. Um, so if you have a central atom with the atomic number greater than 10, so remember that would be atoms that, are, that have valence electrons that are in the third shell, n equals 3 shell. If, if z is greater than 10, these ones can expand their octet, which means it is possible in some cases to have more than eight electrons surrounding them. So greater than eight electrons can be possible for these um, if you have a large enough atomic number. If the atomic number is less than 10, so we're talking about things in the 2s and 2p block primarily, these ones will never go beyond eight electrons, or as we say, they'll never exceed the octet rule. Okay, so this octet rule is a rule that is sometimes violated when drawing Lewis structures, and you need to know when it's okay to violate it and when it's not. So if it depends on the, the, the atomic number of the, of the element. If it's greater than 10, it's okay to add more than eight electrons if that's necessary. Not always gonna be the case. If it's less than 10, you're going to never do that, and you always have exactly eight electrons in almost every case. Another point that I've already made, but I want to emphasize in writing, is that only the central atom will ever expand its octet. So if you're going to have an atom that, oh, that, that violates the octet rule or goes beyond eight electrons, it's going to have to be the central atom, never the outer atoms. All right, I, even as thinking as obscure as I can possibly think, I can't think of any exceptions to that rule that the central atom will be the only one that expands the octet. And then finally, there are two elements besides hydrogen that are going to have fewer than eight electrons in most cases. So hydrogen, as we said, is one that only has one valence electron as an atom. It's only going to form one single bond uh, when you make molecules with it. But there's two others that are not going to quite get up to eight electrons. So beryllium which tends to prefer to have four electrons, and boron, which tends to prefer to have six valence electrons, will in almost every case have incomplete octets. All right, so in those cases, you will not want to go up to eight electrons. You'll stop at either four or six. So those are really the two exceptions you want to be very familiar with, or what we call electron deficient atoms, ones that tend to have fewer than eight electrons when they form uh, molecular compounds. Okay, so those are some things about completing the octet and adding lone pairs. So let's see how that works then with the examples we're working through, PCL3, NO3- and IF5. So as we said, this has 26 total electrons. And what we drew initially were three single bonds. That's what we started with. That uses up six of our electrons. Now we have 20 more that we still have to distribute. So the first thing we're going to do is complete the octet of all of the outer atoms, which are chlorine. So if you look at chlorine, it starts out with only two electrons. So when we're completing octets, we count shared electron pairs as belonging to that atom. 
So each bond counts as two electrons, so each chlorine is now uh, sharing two electrons, so that's two of the eight. We have to add six more to get to eight total electrons on chlorine. So what you're going to do in just about every case with the outer atoms is you're going to add six more electrons as lone pairs to give it a total of eight. So now this chlorine has two from the bond, it has six surrounding it as lone pairs, that's a total of eight, and we're going to do that to each and every chlorine in the molecule. So that used up 18 of our remaining 20, 3 times 6 is 18, so we still have two more that are going to go on the central atom. So this is a total of 24 electrons now, each chlorine has 8, 3 times 8 is 24, we have two more left, and so those now will go on the central atom. So only once we've completed the octet of the outer atoms do we end up putting anything on the central atom. In this case, we did have two leftover electrons to, to do that with. All right, NO3 minus, as we saw, has 24 valence electrons, starting with the single bonds to all the oxygens. Those are two electrons on each oxygen. We add six more to give them a total of eight. So just like we did on the previous one, each oxygen gets additional six electrons or three pairs to bring it up to eight total. This is a total of 24 electrons already. Um, and if, if I want to be technical here, I should put a bracket with a minus charge because this is a totally a negatively charged species. But uh, if you look at this, we have each oxygen has eight electrons now. So we have eight, 16, 24. So this uses up all 24 of our electrons. So we have no more left to put in the central atom. So in this case, the central atom does not get any lone pairs because we've used all 24 electrons to complete the octets of the outer atoms. So we stop there for now. And then finally, IF5 had 42 electrons. And this is a case where we actually have no choice but to expand the octet because just by drawing single bonds to all the fluorines, we already have 10 electrons around the central atom. Okay. Each, one, each bond is two electrons. So this iodine already has more than eight electrons. It's already expanded this octet, and that's fine because iodine is one of the heavier elements beyond atomic number 10, so it's allowed to do that. But now we have to figure out where the rest of the electrons go. So that was 10 of our electrons. We have 32 left. And so we're going to complete the octet of the outer atoms first. Each fluorine gets six more electrons to bring it up to a total of eight. Two from the bond, six from the lone pairs. So we do that for all five of these. Taking stock where we are now, we have five fluorines with eight electrons each. That's 40 total electrons. That means we have two more left, and once again, those last two are going to go on the central atom. Okay, so now that'll use up all 42 of our valence electrons. All right, so this is where we are now. Um, as I have it labeled, this is step three. Any questions up until this point? All right, now the last thing we have to do is determine whether we need to form any double or triple bonds yet. So you look at the central atom in the, each of these and determine, does this have a complete octet? Remember, it needs to have, unless it's one of those special ones, it needs to have eight or sometimes more than eight electrons. If we go back to these here, if we look at phosphorus in this PCL3, we count the electrons that are on phosphorus. Phosphorus has three bonds. That's a total of six electrons. Plus it has two more that are from the lone pair. So phosphorus has eight electrons. So this one is happy, it satisfies the octet rule. Okay, so you want to look at the central atom now to see if it needs more electrons. If we look at the nitrogen and nitrate as we have it drawn now, this only has three single bonds still on the nitrogen. So two, four, six, this one only has six electrons. So this one has an incomplete octet. Nitrogen is not one of those that we expect to have an incomplete octet, so we have to do something else. That's what the next step is going to be. I have five, as we said, the iodine, has two, four, six, eight, ten from the bonds, two more as a lone pair. This has a total of 12 electrons. So this one actually exceeds the octet, so it's, which it's allowed to do. But anyone that doesn't have at least eight electrons, if it doesn't have a complete octet, we need to form multiple bonds to take care of that. So the only one that this applies to is nitrate. So as we saw, when we used up all the electrons by drawing single bonds and lone pairs, This nitrogen only had six electrons. That little 
square means uh, is a partial bracket. I don't draw a whole bracket. It says negative charge. But anyway, this only has six electrons, so we need to draw a double bond to make sure that the central atom has eight. So when we do that, we can't add more electrons to this. We've already added all 24, so we have to take off one of the lone pairs from oxygen, and we're going to make that instead into a shared bond between nitrogen and oxygen, make it into a double bond. So we're going to change this where in one of these positions we draw a double bond. So this oxygen now only has four lone pair electrons because we've taken off one of the pairs and turned it into a shared bonding pair. We leave the other two the same. because This nitrogen only needs two more electrons, so it only needs to have one more bond to get that. And now it's going to have eight electrons on each atom. Because if you look at the nitrogen now, it has a total of four bonds, one double bond, two single bonds, four times two is eight. So now our nitrogen is happy, it has this complete octet. So I want to remind you when you do this, you're going to always remove a lone pair to make before you make a double bond. You can't add additional electrons. We don't want to uh, add more after we've already accounted for how many we have. So you, add, you remove a lone pair and turn one of those into a double bond. And you do that as many times as is necessary to complete the octet of the central atom. In this case, we only had to do it once because it already has six electrons here. We just need to make one double bond to get it up to eight. But you have to make, in some cases, you'll have to draw more than one double bond, or you'll have to draw a triple bond, or whatever the case is. So that's when we draw double bonds at the beginning. We, we just make sure that everything has a complete octet. Then the last thing we're going to do is evaluate what are called formal charges. Um, so the, the last thing we're going to do is evaluate what are called formal charges, and this is going to help us determine if we need to have any more double bonds beyond what we already drew to complete the octet. Because sometimes completing the octet is not still going to give you the best structure, you have to possibly add additional double bonds as well. So let's define formal charge. Uh, it's the charge on an atom so it's the charge an atom would have if the bonding electrons are shared equally. All right, so we talked about how in covalent bonds um, the electrons are shared, but they're not necessarily shared equally. But if we assumed equal sharing of the bonding electrons, we could then figure out what would the charge on that atom be if, if all those electrons were distributed in that way. And what should happen is that the sum of all the formal charges in your molecule, so each atom in the molecule is going to have a formal charge associated with it that we can calculate, and that sum of all those should be the total charge of the molecule or ion. Okay. So if you're drawing a Lewis structure for a neutral molecule that has no charge, the sum of all the formal charges would be zero. If you're drawing a, a, an ion, like nitrate, as we saw, NO3 minus, that has a net negative charge, or in some cases a net positive charge, the sum of all the positive, sorry, the sum of all the formal charges should equal whatever that net charge is. Okay? So that's one way to check that your formal charges are reasonable. And then how do we calculate it for each atom? So We can do this for every atom in the structure once we draw a Lewis structure. So first you start with the number of valence electrons that that atom has. That's for the free atom by itself. That's the number we use when we're counting up the valence electrons at the very beginning. How many electrons did that atom contribute to the, to the molecule? You subtract the number of bonds that that atom has. Remember, this is for each individual atom. So you're not adding up all of the total bonds in the structure. You're just adding up the number of bonds that that particular atom has. Or another way to think about this term is that it's one-half times the number of bonding electrons. Each bond is two electrons. Um, and so you're just taking each bonding pair and you're splitting it. You're giving one of those electrons to that atom. As I said, we're assuming they're shared equally. And then you subtract however many non-bonding electrons that atom has in the structure. Okay? And all of the non-bonding electrons belong exclusively to that atom, so you don't have to divide them up between the atoms or anything like that. So that's what formal charge is. You're assuming 
that the neutral atom brought in this many valence electrons, and you're comparing that number to how many electrons does it actually have in the structure. All right, and this is best learned with, with examples, so let's do it for uh, the ones we're getting. But before we get to that, let's talk about why formal charges are even important. And the reason why we always want to evaluate formal charges when we're drawing Lewis structures is that we want to be able to minimize them. The best Lewis structure that we can draw for a molecule is going to have the minimum number of formal charges possible. So if you have a neutral molecule, we said the sum of the formal charges should be zero for that, but ideally a neutral molecule will have no formal charges at all. Now this is not always possible, but for most neutral molecules, you're not going to have any formal charges present. And so if you do, you need to think about drawing you know, extra double bonds or things to take care of that, as we'll see how to, how to do. So that should be an R, let's go with an N. Okay, so a neutral molecule should have zero formal charges if possible. It won't always be possible. And then for ions, you have no choice but to have formal charges because the sum of the formal charges will be non-zero in an ionic species. So there's going to be formal charges somewhere. That's unavoidable. Um, but you want to minimize how many of those you have and their magnitude. All right, so even though you're, you have no choice but to have some, you shouldn't have too many formal charges. And they also shouldn't be too large. Um, I don't like to give definitive rules like this because probably, you know, some smart, ac smart aleck chemistry teacher, smart aleck, um, some smart aleck chemistry teacher out there would think of an exception to this rule and be like, haha, you're wrong, and, and make fun of me for it. However, what I will say is for the Lewis structures that we're going to draw on this course, you should never have a formal charge that's anything besides plus one or minus one. If you draw a structure and you have a plus two or a minus two uh, formal charge somewhere, that means you need to, to work on your structure a little bit. So they're going to be plus one or minus one, and in many cases you won't have them at all, as we said. Um, but what happens if we have a positive and a negative formal charge next to each other in the molecule? We can cancel those out by drawing another multiple bond. So this is where formal charges allows us to determine, do I need to draw more double or triple bonds in the structure? If you have two formal charges next to each other, one positive, one negative, we can get rid of both of those by changing one of the lone pairs into a, into a shared bonding pair and make another multiple bond. So we will see, uh, I don't think any of these ones have this example, but we'll see examples of that later on. So if you have a positive and negative formal charge on adjacent atoms, you can cancel those by drawing a double bond or an, an additional bond is maybe a better way to say that. Right, so essentially you remove a non-bonding pair of electrons from the one that has a negative formal charge and you turn that into another bond between the two atoms to get rid of that formal charge. All right. Another thing to keep in mind is that even though formal charges are sometimes important, the octet rule reigns supreme. So the octet rule is the most important rule to consider and we don't want any improper violations of the octet rule in the name of formal charges. So you're only going to exceed the octet again if the atomic number of both, well, of anything that has more than ten electrons, has to be greater than ten. Okay. So there there will be situations, and we'll see one just in a minute here, where you have a positive and negative formal charge next to each other. It's really tempting to draw another bond to cancel it out, but you can't do that without exceeding the octet rule for an atom that is not allowed to do that. So you have to make sure that the octet rule is considered first before trying to mess around with formal charges too much. All right, so let's determine the formal charges on each atom in these structures. This is how we drew them out by making sure all the octets were complete. And so we're going to do this now for every atom and see, see what we have. All right, so for PCL3, we're going to do it for each atom. So as we saw at the very beginning of this exercise, phosphorus contributed five valence electrons to the structure. And to find the formal charge, we're going to subtract the number of electrons that are actually belonging to phosphorus in this molecule. So we subtract out the number of bonds that phosphorus has, 
So phosphorus has three single bonds, one, two, three, a total of three bonds. And then we subtract out the number of non-bonding electrons that are on phosphorus. That's going to be those two there, one pair of electrons on phosphorus. So five minus three minus two gives us zero formal charge for phosphorus. Okay. And then for chlorine, each chlorine, chlorine is in group seven of the periodic table, 7A. And so it contributed seven valence electrons to the molecule. That's what we did at the very beginning. If we have to look at each individual chlorine by itself. So if we look at this top one here, this chlorine has one bond, just one bond between phosphorus and chlorine. And then it has a total of six non-bonding electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, three lone pairs. And all the three chlorines are identical, right? So we just have to do it for one of them. This chlorine is zero. This chlorine also has one bond and six lone pair electrons. This one is one bond and six lone pairs. So all of the chlorines are identical. They all have zero formal charges. And so this Lewis structure is as good as it's going to get. We don't have to make any changes to it. Okay, because every atom has zero formal charge. Every atom has a complete octet. And that's the, the situation where we, we know we're done. Okay? So for this one, we've, everything checks out. Now if we do nitrate, NO3 minus, we can do it for the nitrogen first. Okay, so nitrogen contributed five valence electrons. It's in group 5A of the periodic table. That's 2P3 configuration, so that's what we were starting with. And then we figure out how many bonds does the nitrogen have. So nitrogen has, as we said, one double bond and two singles. One, two, three, four, total of four bonds. Remember, we have to count double bonds as two individual bonds. So there's four bonds for nitrogen, and then we, as we said, it has no lone pair electrons because we ran out, we couldn't put any more nitrogen. So that's gonna be a zero. So this nitrogen has a plus one formal charge, okay? It has five valence electrons as a neutral atom, has four bonds in the structure, or four bonding electrons that belong to it, no lone pairs, gives us a net of plus one. If we look at the oxygens in this molecule, we notice that there's two different types. Two of the oxygens down here have a single bond, and then this oxygen up here is a double bond. So we're gonna have to calculate formal charges for both of those separately because there are two different arrangements of electrons. So we'll call these OA, the, and then I'll call this OB to distinguish the two. So oxygen A, the ones that have single bonds here, the two at the bottom as I've drawn it, oxygen has six valence electrons, it's in group six of the periodic table. Each of these oxygens has one single bond, okay? So it has a single bond, so we subtract one, and then it also has six lone pair electrons, or six non-binding electrons. So those oxygens are each going to be minus one, the ones that are labeled as A. They have one bond and six non-bonding. And then for oxygen B, the one up top of the double bond, this has six valence electrons still as a neutral atom. Now it has two bonds, it has a double bond, so they're gonna count that as two. And then it has one, two, three, four that are non-bonding. And so that oxygen has no formal charge. So what you'll sometimes see when people draw Lewis structures is they'll actually put the formal charges in. Plus, and then these two are gonna be minus. We put them near the atoms that have them. Now you might think that we could improve the situation because as I said, if there's a plus and a negative next to each other, you could get rid of those by drawing another double bond, you know, making another one of these nitrogen oxygen bonds a double bond. However, we can't do that here, because remember, nitrogen already has eight electrons, two, four, six, eight. Nitrogen is atomic number seven, it's not beyond 10, so nitrogen cannot have more than eight electrons. So this is the best structure we're gonna get for this. It's very tempting to draw another double bond and cancel out these two formal charges, but if we do that, we'll violate the octet rule, and the octet rule is the most important one to follow. So we can't violate the octet rule for nitrogen because it's in the second row of the periodic table, so we don't want to do that here. We'll see an example a little bit later where we do that. Alright, and then finally for IF5, let's calculate formal charges for these. We have an iodine, we have five fluorines, all the fluorines are identical, so we don't have to calculate them individually. If you look at the central atom iodine, halogens contribute seven valence electrons, this one has five bonds, one single bond to each fluorine, so a total of five bonds. And then it also has two non-bonding electrons as a lone pair. Seven minus five minus two is zero. Okay, so the central atom has zero formal charge. The outer atom is fluorine. Also contributing seven valence electrons. 
each fluorine individually has one bond, and then one, two, three, four, five, six non-bonding electrons that surround it. So seven minus one minus six is also zero. So this is another situation where we have zero formal charges, so we don't have nothing to worry about. Um, two different combinations of valence electrons, but they both end up having zero formal charge. Another pattern you'll see, um, and this is also one of those things that's pretty close to a rule, if you have fluorine or any other halogen as one of your outer atoms, so here it's fluorine, but it could be chlorine over here, or you could have either bromine or iodine. If they're, if they're one of your outer atoms, they're gonna have no formal charge. You should never have a formal charge on a fluorine or a chlorine or a bromine or iodine if they're the ones that are on the outside, specifically, okay? So that's another pattern you'll see as you do more and more of these. All right, so those are the formal charges, and as it turns out, on the basis of octet rule and formal charge, these are the best Lewis structures that we can draw for all three of these. There's nothing additional that we can do, okay? Now, one last detail about the NO3 minus structure is the idea that um, sometimes if you have multiple bonds on your on your structure, either double bonds or triple bonds, sometimes there's more than one way to draw these. All right, so we notice for NO3 minus that our central atom has one double bond and two single bonds. And what we see is that it's sometimes possible to arrange the bonds in different ways. This is what we call resonance. Okay, so when we were drawing the NO3 minus structure, we started out with, sorry, we draw it the same way I did before. We started out with three single bonds. And then what we ended up doing was we had this arrangement down here, we draw a double bond there as we saw. And so we chose arbitrarily to put the double bond here between the nitrogen and the top oxygen. But is there any reason why we couldn't have also put the double bond between one of these other nitrogen and oxygen pairs? So this double bond doesn't have to be here. It could also be down here with this oxygen. And then if we do that, these two oxygens are gonna have six lone pairs, and this is only gonna have four. So that's an alternative way of drawing the structure that's exactly equivalent. All of the octet rules are still obeyed. All of the formal charges are still distributed equally. We have a plus one in nitrogen and two negative ones in oxygen. So perfectly equivalent structure. We draw this as a double arrow to indicate resonance. And then the other way we could draw this is put the double bond down there with single bonds at those two positions. So in other words, this structure has one nitrogen and oxygen double bond and there's three equivalent places we could put it. So it doesn't really matter how, how, where we put it, and really the best way to draw this structure is to show that all three of these are in resonance. And so what resonance really means is that your real structure is in between all three of these uh, individual structures. So you have a nitrogen, you have three oxygens around it, and then one of these bonds, this double bond as we show, is sort of delocalized around the whole molecule. So this extra bond is sort of constantly, you, you don't want to think of it as, as moving around, but all three of these bonds are identical between nitrogen and oxygen, but they're in between a single and a double bond. And so we say that this one pair of electrons, this one pair that we're drawing as a double bond in all of these structures as a second bond, is delocalized, it's, it's really shared between the nitrogen and all three oxygens, it's not localized between one nitrogen and one oxygen, it's between all of them. And if we so if we wanted to define a bond order for each of these nitrogens, they're gonna be in between single and double. So the nitrogen is not a single bond, it's not exactly a double bond. And so if we wanna calculate that for this, we have a total of four bonding pairs that are shared between nitrogen and oxygen. We have one, two, three, four bonds total four bonding pairs. Those are shared between three nitrogen-oxygen pairs. Three oxygens are sharing those bonding pairs. 
And so the bond order in this case is four thirds or one and one third. So the bond order for between nitrogen and oxygen is in between single and double because this one bonding pair is delocalized between all the nitrogens and oxygen. Um, an analogy you sometimes see for resonance is, um, I think your book uses this one. If, imagine that you have um, two resonance structures, one's a horse and one's a rhinoceros. The real structure of the molecule would be a unicorn, which would be the combination of the horse and the rhinoceros. Okay, so you know, a unicorn is not a horse or a rhinoceros, it's the combination of the two. And just like this nitrate structure, it's not that it's two single bonds and one double bond here or here or here, it's that it's the combination of all three of these sort of added together or, or superimposed on each other, okay? So that's how I think about resonance, is the real structure is a combination of all these. The best way to draw that, though, is to just show that double bond traversing around the different positions that it can be. So that's, that's one final detail. Any questions on this? Okay. Um, now let's move on to one more example that illustrates the idea of using um, formal charges to expand the octet. So let's do SO3 in this case. So we first need to count the valence electrons. Let's go all, all through all the steps of how we do that. We have sulfur and we have oxygen in this, in this formula. If we go to the periodic table, sulfur and oxygen are both in group six here, right on top of each other. So group six has six valence electrons, so sulfur will contribute six. East oxygen will contribute six as well. Okay, so we have one sulfur with six valence electrons. We have three oxygens, which each also contribute six. And so this is going to be another structure that should have 24 valence electrons. Okay? So when we draw this Lewis structure, and I want, I want you to be aware of also that on the homework assignments and on the test, we will sometimes tell you not to violate the octet rule, and then sometimes we won't say anything about the octet rule, in which case it's okay to do that sometimes. So I want to be, uh, I'll try to point out both of those possibilities here as we do this one. But let's start by just following all the rules we did before. So we put the less electronegative atom, which is sulfur, in the center. We start with single bonds here to all, each oxygen. And then we're going to complete the octets of the outer atoms first. So by adding six more electrons to each oxygen, they now have eight electrons total. But if we look at our central atom, this is another one a lot like nitrate, where this sulfur here only has six electrons, fewer than eight. And so because our central atom, as we've drawn it here, has fewer than eight electrons, we need to remedy that by drawing a double bond. All right, so just like we saw before, we can remove one of these lone pairs and make it into a double bond. And so we draw one sulfur-oxygen double bond. Now, if we, t if we told you to draw the Lewis structure of SO3, assuming that every atom obeys the octet rule, you'll sometimes see that statement given on homework problems or test problems, assuming every atom obeys the octet rule, if that was the case, we would stop here. Because in this structure here, each atom has exactly eight electrons around it. Each oxygen has eight. The central sulfur now has eight. And so we could still draw resonance structures for this. We can move the double bond around but we wouldn't want to draw any additional double bonds or lone pairs anywhere else because these are all complete octets. However, if we said draw the Lewis structure of SO3 to minimize the formal charges, then we'd have to evaluate the formal charges on this and decide if we need to draw any more double bonds. So we're going to look at the formal charges of this. We have our sulfur and we have two different oxygens in here. We have oxygen, I'll call this one A down here. And now do what we did before, and this one up here, oxygen B. So we have sulfur, we have two different oxygens, A and B, that we're going to calculate formal charges for. And so if we do formal charge for sulfur, um, what we'll see is that sulfur brought in six valence electrons. That's what we saw up here. This central atom now has four bonds, one, two, three, four, and it has zero lone pair electrons. So right now, the formal charge for sulfur is plus two. That's not really a good situation to be in, as we said. 
Um, so we have a, a pretty high formal charge on sulfur, and then if we look at the oxygens, each oxygen that I've labeled as A here started with six valence electrons and now has one single bond and six non-bonding electrons. So each of these is a minus one formal charge. And then oxygen that I've labeled B up here with a double bond started with six. This one has two bonds and one, two, three, four non-bonding electrons, so that has no formal charge. So you want to draw a little zero up there, you can. But we have a lot of formal charges in this molecule as we've drawn it. So if we obey the octet rule, we see that we have a plus two formal charge on sulfur, a negative one formal charge on oxygen. So if we want to minimize formal charges, we have to draw additional double bonds. And as we said, each time you have a positive and a negative next to each other, you can draw a double bond to cancel those out. And this is going to illustrate how that works. So we have a plus two and two minus ones. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove one lone pair from each oxygen, and we're gonna make it into a double bond between that sulfur and oxygen. So we'll do that here. We'll remove one lone pair, make it a double bond. And so now we're gonna have three identical sulfur oxygen bonds. And so from each oxygen, we've removed one of the lone pairs, and now they, they only have four non-bonding electrons or two pairs left. And this is the final structure that we're going to get. And if we calculate the, the formal charges here, you'll see that there's zero formal charge. So if we were told to minimize formal charge, this is the structure we would want to draw up here. Three identical sulfur oxygen double bonds. All of them, every atom in the structure has no formal charge anymore because we've taken these positive and negative formal charges and cancel them by drawing additional double bonds, okay? So you have zero formal charges in this one, so that's what you would do if you were trying to minimize formal charge. Now the reality of the situation is that in chemistry, there's you know a little bit of controversy about you know to what extent do central atoms ever expand their octet. Um, so we teach you sort of both ways to do it, the way where you follow the octet rule to a T and don't give anything more than eight electrons, but we also say, well, in some cases it's possible to draw a better structure by minimizing formal charge um, and the chemical reality obviously is a lot more complex than either of these two simple extremes but um, we want to be familiar with both of those possibilities when you when you do practice problems this week on the homework assignment. Alright and then the last one is uh, just one more example of, of resonance where sometimes we'll give you a bunch of resonance structures for a compound. So this is ClO3 minus um, pretty similar to nitrate as we see but um, this is another molecule that can have resonance. We want to ask you, which is the most important resonance contributor for ClO3 minus? So if we're giving you a, a, a bunch of, of resonance structures or possible structures for a molecule and asking you which is the most important resonance structure, um, the, the two things we have to evaluate, or I guess really three things are, first of all, do they have the correct number of electrons? So when you draw resonance structures for for a, for a Lewis structure for any sort of molecule or ion, the Lewis structures all have to have the, the correct number of valence electrons. You can't have a resonance structure that has a different number of valence electrons. So let's first make sure that that's true for all of these. So if we're going to count the number of electrons in ClO3 minus, chlorine contributes 7, oxygen contributes 6 each, we have a negative charge, so it's going to add one more. Don't draw the line yet. And so when we add these up, we should have 26 electrons. So any resonance structure that we draw for ClO3 minus, whether it's a particularly good Lewis structure or, or, or sort of bad one, they should have 26 electrons at minimum. So if we look at choice A, um, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 26 for A, I don't want to spend five minutes counting. B also has 26 valence electrons. C will have 26. They're all just arranged in different ways. However, if we look at choice D here, we see that each oxygen has eight electrons, two, four, six, eight, so that's 24. But now we only have one single electron on chlorine. Now, it is sometimes possible to have electrons that aren't paired up, but in this case, this structure only has 25 electrons. Okay? It has eight around the oxygens, one more on the central atom. That's not the correct number of electrons here so we can discount that as being a viable Lewis structure for this compound because it has the wrong number of electrons. We don't need to evaluate it any further than that. Now the next thing to look at is octet rule. So 
So we're going to figure out, do any of these structures have an incomplete octet where they shouldn't, or do any of them violate the octet rule where they shouldn't? And in this case, we see that all of them are fine. So in choice A, the chlorine has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 electrons. Each oxygen has 8. In choice B, the chlorine has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So it has 6 bonds plus, sorry, 5 bonds plus a lone pair. Each oxygen still has 8. And then for choice C, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 on chlorine. Each oxygen still has 8. So there's no that are uh, problematic. The only atom that, that exceeds the octet rule is the chlorine, which is the central atom. It's, it's greater than atomic number 10, so it's allowed to do that. All the oxygens have eight electrons, so we have nothing to worry about here with that octet rule. And so then the last thing that we evaluate is the formal charge. Okay, so if you look at formal charges on all of these, We've seen this a number of times already. If you have an oxygen that has a single bond and six lone pairs, that gives you a negative one formal charge. Six minus one minus six is minus one. So each of those are minus one. An oxygen with a double bond and two lone pairs has zero formal charges. Six minus two from the bonds minus four non-bonding. Six minus two minus four is zero. So these are some patterns that you'll, as you do this more and more, you'll start to recognize without having to think about them. And then for the central atom here, we have one, two, three, four bonds, and we have two lone pairs. So seven minus four minus two is plus one. Okay, so this resonance structure A has a plus one formal charge in the central atom, and it has minus one formal charges on the oxygens. Not a bad situation, but we should be able to improve this by drawing a double bond between those. And so then we'll look at choice B, and that's exactly what they've done. They've taken one of these oxygens here, removed the lone pair, and made another double bond. So now we have two oxygens that have zero formal charges with a double bond and four non-bonding electrons. Still one oxygen has a minus one. In our central atom chlorine should be seven valence electrons. We have one, two, three, four, five bonds, and we have a lone pair. Seven minus five minus two is zero. So in this structure, the only formal charge is out here on oxygen. There has to be a formal charge because this has a net minus one charge. We can't get rid of it altogether. But that looks like a pretty good situation. Let's look at choice C now. We have all the oxygens now have double bonds. So all the oxygens are going to have zero formal charge. And then our central atom has one, two, three, four, five, six bonds and two lone pair electrons. Seven minus six minus two is minus one. So in this case, the negative one formal charge is on the central atom. So the question is, between these two structures, B and C, we can get rid of A because A has a lot of extra formal charges, but between B and C, which one is the better arrangement? Do we want to have the negative formal charge on oxygen or on chlorine? If you have a choice, it's going to be better to have the negative formal charge on the more electronegative atom, which is going to, in almost every case, be the outer atom. All right, so we want the negative formal charge to go on the more electronegative atom. If we go to the periodic table quickly to see where those are, chlorine is down here, oxygen is up here. It's not necessarily obvious from the periodic table which one's more electronegative, but one thing you should remember is that oxygen is the second most electronegative atom behind fluorine. Um, and as we said, the outer atoms tend to be the more electronegative ones anyway. So it's better to have the negative formal charge on the oxygen instead of the chlorine, which makes choice B the one that's the best or most important resonance contributor. It minimizes the formal charges and it makes sure that the negative formal charge is localized on the more electronegative oxygen atom. So that's just one little uh, additional wrinkle that we'll see sometimes. We'll give you structures and ask you to evaluate them and, and choose which one is the best or most important resonance contributor. All right, any questions on Lewis structures before we move on to the next topic? All right, so we're gonna get into the last topic for chapter three now, the last topic before the exam, which is nomenclature. I think for mo in most cases this one's pretty straightforward and a lot of it should be review for many of you that took high school chemistry. Um, so we're going to do nomenclature for three types of compounds. We're going to do ionic compounds, we're going to do covalent compounds, and then there's going to be a special class of compounds called acids that are a subclass of covalent compounds that we'll deal with. And we're going to learn the proper way to assign names to all of these compounds using their, their chemical formula or vice versa, giving you the name and changing that into a chemical formula for the compound. 
So let's start with ionic compounds first. That's, I think, the, the simpler of the cases in some, um, in some sense. So the order that we put everything in is, remember, an ionic compound includes a metal paired with a nonmetal. A metal which has an, a, a positive charge, then the nonmetal acquires a negative charge. And so when we're naming the compounds, we put the metal first, which is going to be the cation in our, in our formula. We put the nonmetal second. Which is our anion. And this ordering applies to both the formula and to the name. So if you're writing out an ionic formula, you want to put the metal first. Or if you're writing out the full name of an ionic compound, you always put the metal first and then the nonmetal second. So that's how it always works for, for ionic compounds. Another thing that's very important as we start this. We're going to see uh, at the beginning of next time when we do covalent compounds, we use numerical prefixes to tell us how many of each element there is, how many of each atom there is in the formula. We don't use any prefixes for ionic compounds. So that's the key distinction between ionic and covalent is the use of prefixes. Okay, so all we do is we just name the metal and the nonmetal and they're paired together. Um, so when we're, when we're putting the different parts of the name together, the cation part and the, the, and the anion part, the metal and the nonmetal, um, the cation we don't really ch we don't change anything at all. It just takes the name of the metal itself. All right. So if we have a formula that has Na plus in it, that part of the name is just going to be sodium. We don't put anything at the end. We don't put anything at the beginning. We just call it sodium. We have Ca2 plus, we just call that calcium, we don't change the name, etc. Now the part where we have to modify the, the name a little bit, the word a little bit, is in the anion part, the second word that goes into our name. And so for the anion, we're going to use the sort of the root element name, and then we're going to change the ending to IDE. Okay? So we know that F is fluorine as a neutral atom. In an ionic compound, it would be F minus, and we would call that fluoride. Okay, so we change the whatever ending it has as an element to IDE to tell us that it's an anion. Um, and then if we had O2 minus, oxygen is, is you know, O. We add a 2 minus charge, and it becomes oxide, IDE ending. N3 minus goes from nitrogen to nitride. Okay, so for these simple monoatomic anions, an atom with a net negative charge, you put an IDE ending in that part of the name. Now, in the formula, in the chemical formula for an ionic compound, we're going to have subscripts. And as we already said, when we were ta first talking about ionic compounds, you're going to use the lowest whole number ratio of the subscripts. So that's nothing new, and that only applies to the chemical formula. Your name doesn't have any subscripts in it or anything numerical in it. Um, Okay, but that's how we deal with subscripts in the formula. Just a reminder, they have to be the lowest whole number ratio. Okay, so let's just do a few examples of uh, ionic compounds. Say we have NgCl2. Okay, we know from the formula here that um, we have Mg2 plus and Cl minus. All right, so the, and then if we go to the periodic table, we can verify that. So um, magnesium is here in group, in group 2, it forms 2 plus cations. Chlorine is here, it forms uh, minus 1 anions. However, we don't even really need to think about the charges. Those are the ions that make it up, but all we need to think about is the names of the ions. And so Mg is magnesium, we don't change the ending. Cl is chlorine, so it becomes chloride. All right, and so there's nothing in the name of a standard ionic compound that tells you what the charge of the ion are. There's nothing that tells you how many of them are. It's just called magnesium chloride. And the fact that magnesium is always plus two and chloride is always minus one tells us that the formula is going to be MgCl2. So we don't have to give you anything in the name that tells you the relative ratios of those because they will always be one to two in any neutral ionic compound when you have a plus two cation with a minus one anion. All right, cesium oxide. We have cesium is CS. Uh, that's one that I guess you wouldn't be expected to know off the top of your head. It's too low on the periodic table. But CS is cesium. We have O2 minus, which as we said is oxide. 
So this will just become cesium oxide. Metal first, non-metal second, IDE ending. So naming these ones with main group metals and non-metals is quite simple. You just have to put the name of the metal first and the name of the non-metal second with an IDE ending. No prefixes, no, sub, no suffixes, nothing else. All right, and then if we, we can go the other way, we can give the formula for the ionic compound as well as the name. So if we have strontium and iodine, we're going to figure out the formula and the name of the ionic compound. We go to the back to the periodic table. So strontium is SR here. I guess that's another one where, uh, beyond where you have to memorize. But SR is here, strontium. It's in group 2A, so it forms two plus cations. It loses two valence electrons to get to the noble gas configuration. Iodide is over, iodine is over here in group 7, so it's going to gain one electron, become a minus one anion. And so the two ions that pair up are SR2 plus and I minus. And so as a review of some things we talked about last time, if you have the charges of the ions, you just make those into the subscripts to get the formula. So this becomes SRI2. We need two of the I minus anions to balance the two plus charge for the cation. And then the name will just be, again, the names of the two constituent species, strontium unchanged, and then iodide tell us that that's the anion part. So that's the name and formula for that. And then sodium and sulfur, back to the periodic table. Sodium is Na right here. It's in the first column of the periodic table, so it forms a plus one cation. Sulfur is here, S2 minus. It's gonna form a two minus anion, it's in group six, so it gains two electrons to achieve noble gas configuration. So we have Na plus, we have S2 minus. Again, the, the charges become the subscripts. If we wanna have a shortcut way of writing the formula, this becomes Na2S. Two plus one cations to balance the minus two anion, but the name is just gonna be simply sodium and then sulfide, just the names of the two elements with the proper ending. Okay, so naming ionic compounds is, is relatively simple because we don't have to change anything except for the ending on the second one. If we go now to transition metals, this is where things get a little bit strange for us. Um, just one little addition to transition metals. They're, they're very similar to um, regular ionic compounds. The formulas for transition metal ionic compounds is going to be the exact same convention. Cation first, then anion, lowest whole number ratio still. So nothing changes there. However, when we're naming transition metal ionic compounds, there's going to be one difference. And the difference stems from the fact that with the dip with transition metals as compared to main group metals, if you're in the D block of the periodic table compared to the S block, those transition metals can very often form cations that have more than one different charge. So iron can form plus two and plus three, or cobalt can do the same thing, plus two and plus three. So because the cation can have two different charges, if you just named the cation and the anion together like we do normally, you wouldn't be able to tell what the formula of that compound is from the name because the, the cation could have possibly more than one different charge. And so we have to put a Roman numeral in parentheses that tells us what the charge of the cation is. Because this is the only way that we can accurately go from the name to the formula because we need to know the charges of both of the ions and for the transition metal those charges are variable. So we indicate what the charge is by using a Roman numeral. Alright, so if we have an ionic compound that has an Fe3 plus cation, Fe is iron, and we will put that into the name as iron 3. We put a Roman numeral three after the iron to tell us that this compound has Fe3 plus. However, if it instead had Fe2 plus, iron with a two plus charge, this, was, this is one of those cations that can form two different kinds, we would call this iron two. Now another nomenclature convention that I don't think you'll be directly responsible for this, but it's sometimes seen and you guys want to be familiar with it, is that for, for cations that have more than one possible charge, the one that has a higher charge 
gets an IC suff suffix. So sometimes instead of seeing iron 3 in the formula, you would see ferric. So it gets the Roman numeral, or the I guess the Greek name followed by an IC ending. Um, or like cupric would be copper 2, for example. And then the one that has the lower charge, so iron has plus 2 and plus 3 charges, the lower one gives you an OUS suffix. So Fe2 plus would be ferrous. All right, and then this picture up here is an inorganic chemist's favorite carnival ride, the Ferris wheel. Okay. So it's Fe2 plus going around in a circle. So those are some naming conventions that you'll sometimes see in textbooks and other resources. I don't think we're going to have you directly responsible for those. Just be familiar with putting the Roman numerals in parentheses. Now the last thing to deal with today are going to be um, polyatomic ions. So we have about five minutes left, so I'll go through these quickly. So polyatomic ions, we already, we already drew the Lewis structure of one. We saw NO3 minus as an example of one. So there are groups of... Covalently bonded atoms that have a net that have a net charge. All right, so these are going to often participate in forming ionic compounds. You'll have ionic compounds where one or sometimes both of the ions is a group of atoms together that have that net charge, as opposed to just single ions that have the positive or negative charge. So they're called polyatomic ions, and there's a whole bunch of them in your book that you have to uh, learn. You have to learn the formula, the charge, and the name of them. It's in Table 3.7. I've given that to you here in case you were uh, unable to get the textbook for some reason or chose not to. So there's a bunch, but th these are the ones that you're going to have to know. So these groups of Covalently bonded atoms are all made of nonmetals, but they're all clustered together in different in different ratios, and they have net charges. So that's what they are. Just gonna let me scroll or not? All right, and then when we're when we're, when we're drawing formulas for uh, polyatomic anions, we should be familiar with the idea that if there's more than one of these polyatomic ions in the formula. It's going to be enclosed in parentheses with the subscript on the outside. All right, so I just want to become familiar with this convention for writing these. All right, so for example, if you had a, an ionic compound that included sodium, which is Na+, plus, and then nitrate, the one that we drew the Lewis structure of, NO3-. minus. In this case, it's a plus one cation, a minus one anion. So just like before for ionic compounds, we would need one of each to balance the charge. And you could just write the formula of this as NaNO3. That's how you would see it. You don't have to put any parentheses around the polyatomic. However, if we had calcium with nitrate, calcium 2 plus with NO3-, minus, again, this whole group of atoms, NO3, is all together with a minus one charge. And so when we want to write the formula for this, we, we again can exchange the charges for subscripts. And so we're going to have one calcium, but then we need two of the NO3 minuses to balance the positive two charge from the calcium. And so the way we would write that is we put the NO3 in parentheses as a group together and then a two on the outside to tell us that we have two of those NO3 minus anions in the formula. So you wouldn't want to write it as you know, NO32 without parentheses, that's really confusing, it looks like NO32, or you wouldn't want to simplify that to N2O6, you want to make sure they indicate that it is NO3 together, so these are not correct, you would want to put those in parentheses. All right, so just uh, ending with some examples, um, Fe2O3, let's name the following compounds. So for transition metal compounds, we do need to figure out the charge on the cation. So we have two irons, we have three oxygens. Oxygen is always going to be two minus. It's in group six of the periodic table. So the nonmetal part is always going to have the same charge. You never change the charge on that. So if we have three two minus anions, how many of the cation, or what does the charge of the cation have to be to balance that? It has to be three plus. 
because we have 6 minus from the anions, 6 plus now from the cations. We already know there's two of them, but the charge was not given to us. And so when we name this, this is going to be iron. Because it's a transition metal, we put the 3 in parentheses to tell us that it's a plus 3 charge. And then oxygen is still oxide, and we don't put anything different there. So this would be iron 3 oxide to tell us that it's a plus 3 charge. And then similarly, lead is another cation. Um, actually, I'm going to do a different one here because I don't think we're going to make you responsible for the P-block cations, although they do form multiple. But let's say we had CuSO4 instead. So this one's going to be copper. And then what you'll learn by studying that table in the back is that SO4 is sulfate, which has a 2 minus charge. And so if our anion is 2 minus and we have one cation that has to balance that charge, that would also have to be 2 plus. Okay, copper can be plus 1 or plus 2. It's one of those other variable ones. So we would call this one copper 2 sulfate. SO4 min 2 minus is called sulfate. That's one of those ones you'll have to just learn. And so again, the, the, the number in parentheses indicates this. And then finally, going backwards from the name to the formula, I think this is even easier because for transition metals, the name gives you the charges directly. Um, so for chromium-3 permanganate, chromium is Cr, and it has a 3 plus charge because of this Roman numeral here. Permanganate is one of the polyatomic anions you'll have to learn. It's MnO4, and the charge on that is minus 1. So you'll have to learn both the name and the charge. And so again, now that we have the charges of the ions that are involved, we just have to balance those charges to write the formula. And so we would need one chromium paired with three permanganates to balance the charge completely. So we write the MnO4 in parentheses, put a three after it to tell us that we have three minus one anions balancing the charge of our plus three cation. And then finally, tin four chloride, another one that can be variable is tin. So tin's formula, uh, symbol is SN. It's plus 4 because that's what the Roman numeral 4 tells us. Chloride is always still minus 1. Remember, we never change the charges on our anions, only if sometimes on the metal, if it's a transition metal or a P-block metal. And so once again, we can just balance the charges by interchanging the, the charges and making subscript to get SNCl4 is the correct formula for that. All right, that takes us to the end of what we want to cover today. Next time we'll cover the nomenclature for covalent compounds. That'll finish up Chapter 3, and then we'll also start on the next chapter, which won't be on this exam.